Awesome. Hello and welcome to today's episode of Light Lunch. Today I am joined by David and Philip from APL. I'm going to let them introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about APL itself. Yeah, hi there. Uh, I'm Philip Menegas from APL. I've been um, working with APL for nine years on the back of um, a career in window manufacturing for a, about 25 years. And APL has been around for a little bit longer than that, about 52 years. Uh, we've been manufacturing window systems. And as of late, uh, of course, we've uh, redesigned our entire uh, window system offering uh, to reflect the changes within the building industry in H1. So all of the residential systems that we have now are all brand new. And uh, as David quite rightly pointed out uh, some months ago, you know, it took us 50 years to get to where we are now. But, uh, you know, in the space of about two years, all of our products are brand new. Wow. So it's been quite a major undertaking for us. Yeah. David Waters uh, joined uh, APL back in 1994, and we're a sort of a, a very much smaller version of where we sort of are today. Um, I was reflecting on that sort of journey with some colleagues of mine uh, in Wellington yesterday, um, going back to uh, the days when APL only had a single brand, which was Vantage Aluminium, and then introduced our first and Eltham brands uh, in the, the mid-90s uh, and the phenomenal growth that we've had um, over that sort of 30-year period now. Um, and, and it's just amazing, I think, Chloe, how 30 years just disappears in the blink of an eye. Um, and even with Philip um, joining, what was it, nine years ago, Philip, mm -hmm. um, that even the last sort of nine years has gone sort of by um, uh, uh, very, very quickly. So... Excuse me a little bit. <laughs> hey, and the changes that have sort of happened as well, I think, um, you know, dramatic, really. Uh, communication. Um, we were, I think Philip and I were talking sort of recently about the um, introduction or introduction of fax machines and how that revolutionised our industry, you know, because prior to that you had to send a, a letter to somebody, you know, who sends a letter? Um and then, obviously, um, then with computerization playing a, a greater role uh, as well uh, in communication. And I think that hey, one of the challenges that both Philip and I have is, in fact, the overwhelming uh, communication that we receive for mm -hmm. um, and the immediacy. You know, I blame McDonald's. I want it and I want it in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. um, so... A communication and the way that we communicate has changed dramatically in the last 30 years. It sure has. It's crazy to think of what. I just don't even know how we worked without computers and instant things. We were a lot more organised back then, Chloe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I can see you'd have to be. Mm. Um, okay, so it's hear about a couple of things that are keeping you awake at night. Do you have something for us, David, that's keeping you awake at night? Yeah, I think that um, Philip and I um, have been doing, in fact, we do a lot of travel and that I've been uh, attending uh, the NZIA Regional Design Awards that we co-sponsor with our good friends at Resine. And I think for Philip and I, um, that we have observed um, the the downturn in the economy. And in fact, I'm just sort of reminded of a, a quote from Bernard Hickey, who said that um, uh, when back on track uh, meant going into reverse. And uh, Chloe, we were talking about it earlier uh, mm. between ourselves. And that I think that for a lot of people, they had a thought that come the Monday after the election that, the economy would actually um, pay, not necessarily get back on track, but but boom, and the opposite has actually happened. And I think that for both, uh, hey, certainly for myself and Philip will tell you what his thoughts are, but I, I think that we reflect on, you know, colleagues that have built up a, a team of architects or builders um, and have to let these people go. Um, and it's one of the, the tragedies, I think, of the building industry that ends up being the whipping boy of government policy. Yeah. So 
certainly a time of reflection, uh, certainly for myself. Absolutely. And do you <clears> have <throat> on that, Philip? Is that keeping you awake at night? Uh, yeah, probably not in the same way that it does, David. I, although I wholeheartedly agree with what David uh, has just said. Um, I, I think, you know, mine is probably on a smaller scale, but uh, industry related, you know, with the changes that we've seen with um, H1 and the increase in performance that uh, everyone has been um, ex expected to actually comply to, uh, that's all very good and well. But I think there still needs to be an enormous amount of education around uh, building performance and how consumers, how the end user actually should operate their home to get the best building performance because a lot of people just don't know hey we we hand over a, a finished product um not not like an appliance i suppose it's a lot more complex than that but they're they're really are they given any instructions on how to operate it mm, um so so uh, we've we've <laughs> increased all these thermal values but we're creating issues within our homes because of the lack of education on how to actually operate these homes properly. And I'd go further to say that, you know, there's further education needs to be done with, from our perspective and other product suppliers, when we provide these high performance systems to builders, project managers, uh, quantity surveyors, so that they understand the benefits of these high performance products rather than try and find ways, and I, and I realise everyone's hurting, but rather than try and find ways of value engineering them out, because there are actually long-term um, monetary benefits for having warmer, drier homes. And it's not just the operation of the house, but it's also better health outcomes. So, so the education around around our built environment, I, I still think we need to do an enormous amount of work uh, in that arena. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree with mm -hmm. um, Philip on that, Chloe. I think that, hey, there's a great opportunity here for some software developers to develop some software where people are proactively, I think, looking after what is, in fact, for many, many people, in fact, for most people, their, their biggest asset. Mm -hmm. And I think that for Philip and I, we see far too often that the, the maintenance is done well after it should have been done and that people tend to do it, you know, reactively rather than proactively. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's certainly something that um, I see in my sort of one of my areas that I look after in the education field as well. You know, the old adage, if you want to, you know, test the durability of a product, put it into a school. And that what I see and Philip observes certainly in the residential uh, market is that, a people's biggest asset and that they they don't necessarily proactively uh, look after sort of items that ought to be looked after. Um, so anyway, any software developer out there want to want to sort of create some software that uh, enables people to uh, understand better what they need to take care of proactively, uh, yeah. opportunity out there, Chloe. Could be. I um, yeah. brought, we brought our first home last spring and went out winter with our single glazed windows <laughs> and wondering how long we can go like that. So might there's, be a there's million spring. homes out there, Chloe, which are single glazed, existing buildings, so you're not alone. Yeah, it's a little bit cold. Yeah. <laughs> not, not, not super used to it. Um, is there anything else burning that's keeping you awake at night or should we jump into some fun things? Yeah, I think that, you know, the, the, hey, the, the things that, you know, I, that are often talked about that Philip and I just sort of discuss on a on a daily basis and that coming back down to the sort of H1. And I think that there is, in fact, a, a misunderstanding, I think, for hey, people up here in the north that think that there's been government overreach with regarding firmly broken frames, high performance double glazing, Philip. And I think they they only look at that in the context of, you know, cold. And I think that you know, with a changing sort of environment that, you know, heat gain into the building uh, is becoming a, a serious sort of issue. And I think that, you know, we can't keep on, you know, with a mentality of an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff whereby we allow the building to overheat to then have to artificially cool it and then conversely allow all the heat to escape to artificially heat it. And I think that, 
for Philip and I, we work constantly, you know, battling people um, that believe that somehow thermal growth of frames and high performance double glazing is not necessarily up here in the north for them. Exactly right. Interesting. Mm. Uh, anything else from you, Philip? No, no, I'm happy to leave it there. Yeah, all right. Let, let, let's hear a little bit about you guys a little bit more personally. Uh, is there anything interesting that you've been reading, listening, or watching lately, David? Um, yeah, hey, reading. I, non work related, non work related. Yeah, no, none of it sort of work related, but I, I have been, um, in fact, I, I read both fiction and non fiction. Um, and uh, non fiction, I'm reading currently um, a book called uh, Light Over Liscard, uh, which is by uh, Louis uh, de, uh, de Paneris. Um, and it's a sort of a, a, a book somewhat um, um, pitched into the future about uh, not necessarily AI, but hey, people are hacking uh, into various systems. And then uh, the main character, uh, who's an absolute genius, sort of hacks the hackers uh, and takes the hackers out. Um, and then, you know, on a slightly different note, um, I, I've been doing quite a bit of reading uh, um, by Paul Callahan, obviously the Callahan um, Foundation, and uh, his great book, uh, Walter Wetter and Get Off the Grass, which was a joint one between uh, Paul and uh, Sean, Sean Henry. And then a, um, a friend of mine uh, suggested a book called The Future uh, by Naomi uh, Alderman that I'll get to read as well. So, uh, yeah, no, I... I I enjoy uh, reading very, very much. So what are you up to? What are you? Uh, what, I, well, what I'm currently reading when I have time is uh, Bill Bryson's book on the body. And uh, Bill Bryson mm. is a very mm. famous uh, travel writer, mm. but he's also uh, writes these uh, amazing books mm. about. Uh, well, this one is on the body, and and you know, it's almost like an operating manual. Uh, another one is uh, called The Home, mm. which uh, tracks the history of houses in our homes and mm. how they came to be. And I know David's read the, the yeah. same book. Brilliant. And uh, he's got various other publications where, where the research is absolutely phenomenal. And mm. some of them are, you know, they're actually great historical documents almost. So I uh, take great pleasure in uh, reading his books when I get the time. I get so much inspiration for reading books from these little light lunches, but then I remember I've got a two-year-old and a baby on the way, and I'm like, I'm going to have time to read these books. But I'll, I'll create a list for the future. Um, what is something you guys are doing for your well-being? You know, well-being is sort of an interesting one, and I think that, you know, pre-COVID, we um, I had our granddaughter uh, live with us uh, over the sort of the, the COVID period and that we we noted how withdrawn that she uh, got during that sort of period, uh, largely uh, confined herself to a bedroom and hardly came out. Um, and, and I remember, in fact, during that sort of same period, that, that first day on lockdown, you know, being somewhat shocked that, you know, for, hey, you know, certainly my generation, the baby boomers, that this was sort of, you know, a, uh, a major event that, that shaped our lives, really. Um, and I remember sort of the shock of sitting behind a desk at home and thinking, Jesus, we're all on lockdown. We can't even go to work. Um, and I think that there's been a sort of an outfall from that um, and how you cope with that going sort of forward. Um, I, I took out a, um, a life membership with Les Mills about sort of 30 years ago. Um, and um, I... Uh, I don't go as much, but I, I do go for walks, um, play golf, um, played a bit of squash. So I, I think that as I've sort of got older, I, I've I've got better at coping with stress. And I think that, you know, having seen some of my colleagues fall over and uh, end up in panic attacks, uh, it certainly uh, makes me mindful of the importance um, of what we do. And I think the importance of actually taking breaks and turning your phone off. I think that that is probably the most important lesson here. You know, turn your bloody phone off um, and hey, turn off, in fact, all social media as well, I think is another important one for uh, good mental health. And Philip, what do you sort of, what do you think? 
exercise and sleep. Yeah. <laughs> and the rest of it will just will take care of itself. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're right, David, like that whole COVID period really like mm. highlighted some of these things for yeah. most of us. And yeah, it was a really good reminder to slow down. And, and I think, you know, some of that, you know, that sort of, um, we were talking earlier, Chloe, about, you know, the way we communicate and that, you know, and I sort of said, you know, I blame McDonald's and I want the information, I want it in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. And that I, I think that you do need to rest your brain uh, from that bombardment that, you know, I know that, that Philip and I get, you know, tens and tens and tens of emails a day, you know, wanting information from us and that when they don't hear inside 30 minutes, they then call you to remind you or to ask, did you get my email? Um, and I think that we do need to, and I, I, I remember in 2004 taking a, a year off and traveling through France and Italy, which was a, uh, um, one of the best things I've ever done. But it, it sort of reminded me about, you know, that work to live, you know, live to work thing and to get that balance right. I think that it's a, sometimes the fact that, that you, you need sort of some sort of scare to jolt you back into um, understanding, in fact, what is important. Absolutely too. But hopefully us talking about it a little bit more will help. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, all right, what is your motto, David? Um, my, my probably the one my go to sort of model is the depth of the outcome to term oh sorry, the depth of the engagement determines the depth of the outcome, really. And I think that I have sort of um, been guided sort of by that my entire working life. Um, and, and I guess in that, what drives that is my passion for the industry. And I know that Philip is the same. Um, and that, hey, and I guess in that, the, the success I've had in my working life is because of that depth of the engagement that both Philip and I have a can do attitude. We very rarely say no, Philip. Um, and that you'll see us at events throughout the whole of New Zealand. Um, and I suspect, actually, as a result of that engagement, that we've been able to penetrate, you know, deep uh, into markets uh, as a result. But I think that the other thing that we've both probably got, Philip, is, is the rewards from that engagement as well. Yeah, I think so. It's, it's part of uh, building a brand, not just the brand, the APL brand, but our own personal brands yep. in the marketplace. So, yeah, I, I agree with uh, the sentiments that David has expressed, although my, my motto is probably more on a personal level, maybe not, not work-related so much, and that is uh, do what makes you happy. And, um, you know, a lot of us actually deny ourselves things because we don't think we deserve something. Uh, you know, if you're sort of questioning whether you should buy yourself something, if you haven't done that for a while, um, you know, at the end of the day, life is short. You know, I'm going to buy myself something after this. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> no, that's all right. No, you, you right, do you. You do you. <laughs> okay, and really quickly before we go, do you guys have some advice for the next generation? Yeah, my one is always sort of, you know, um, you know, to our granddaughter, you know, find your passion and your voice and, um, you know, I mean, speak up, you know, and I think that, don't, you know, let, you know, things simply slide when somebody says something that's clearly untrue. Um, don't join the crowd um, mm -hmm. and that find your own voice um, and speak up when you see something that's not right. But also find your passion as well. I think that, you know, what's driven me throughout my entire working life really is a passion for what I do. Um, and I think that manifests itself in that sort of outcome really and that any success I think that I've been had uh, as uh, through that passion uh, for what we do, for what I do at least. Mm -hmm. Phil? Uh, my advice would be have a plan. Yeah. Have a plan and try and stick to it. You know, it doesn't matter whether it's a, a one week plan, one month, one year, 10 years, you know, have a plan. Mm -hmm. At least have something to shoot for, something to aim for, because if you don't have anything, then you're not going to achieve anything. That's absolutely correct. Yeah. I like that. Great advice. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining me today, guys. And um, we'll see you all next time.
Thanks, yeah, Chloe. Thank you, Chloe. Thank you. Thanks, Appreciate the opportunity. Bye. See ya.